Good morning, church. We are so excited to worship together with you this morning. But first, we have a few announcements. Our staff has put together buttons that will allow you to easily invite friends, stay connected, and give throughout the service. These buttons are dropped throughout our gathering in the chat, so make sure to keep an eye out for them. After Pastor Frank's message, we will pause to remember Jesus' death and resurrection by participating in communion. Please take a moment right now to gather what you'll need, some bread and some grape juice or wine, what the Bible calls the fruit of the vine. If you don't have any fruit of the vine at your house, use water. Jesus is the living water after all, and Christians throughout the centuries have substituted some other life-giving beverage when wine or juice isn't available. Now, let's join together in worship.
who's in us greater is the one who calls our name he will never fail you will never fail good morning church my name is frank weller i'm the senior minister at south lansing christian church and i want to ask you to stick around through the end of our gathering because we have an important announcement about our plan to return to corporate worship you know, we've all found ways to pass the time during this pandemic. One of the things I've done is I've gone back through my wife's Facebook history and I've looked at all the recipes that she's marked and I've begun preparing some of those at home. Like a couple weeks ago, I made some sauteed ginger shrimp with asparagus. Mmm, really good. Last week, I made something new for Tracy. I baked some homemade bread and then I made her... Um, just a grilled cheese. Now, this wasn't just any old grilled cheese. I took the two slices of homemade bread, but in the middle, instead of just putting cheese, I put mac and cheese. And so I made her grilled mac and cheese sandwich. Man, she really liked that. But homemade bread isn't the only thing that I've baked. I've just found baking, for whatever reason, to help pass the time, to be a really cathartic experience. I've baked homemade pretzels. I made our version of Disneyland's famous cinnamon churros. Uh, again, I've baked homemade bread. And then just the other night, I made about eight dozen Toll House cookies. My inspiration for those cookies was Walter and Jamie's daughter, Genesis. I dropped Walter off at his house the other night after he and I made a trip to Chicago and back. And little Genesis came up and she said, Frank, did you bring me cookies? Uh, Genesis knows that on Sunday mornings when we're all here together at 6300 Aurelius, she can stop in my office and get a cookie from the cookie jar. So naturally she thought I would bring her cookies. And so the other night I found myself in our kitchen perfecting my version of Nestle's Toll House cookies. And I decided to listen to some music. And, and so I just said, Alexa, play Southern Gospel music. Now, while some of you are scrambling to turn off your smart speaker right now, let me tell you about one of the songs that she played. It was written by Bill Gaither in 1971, and I remember it really well from my childhood. My parents used to play it on the record player, and it went like this. Something beautiful, something good, all my confusion he understood all I had to offer him was brokenness and strife, but he made something beautiful of my life. You remember that song? I know some of you do. That was the perfect song for me in that moment. Because for me, at least, the last eight weeks have been filled with confusion. For many of you, they've been filled with brokenness. They've been filled with strife. And it's really been challenging for a lot of us to sort that all out and to make sense of all of what we're experiencing. And the forced isolations made it even more difficult. At a time when we really need to pull together, when we really need to be around other people, the thing is, we're all segregated in our own homes. We can't be around each other. And it's just really increased the sense of anxiety and isolation, and it's had an effect on all of us. You know, one of the things it's done is it's reminded us what really matters. Family, friends, relationships. It's revealed who we really are, the cracks in our character, the conflicts in our marriages or our relationships, the challenges we've had parenting in close quarters where everybody's together all the time. But I believe it's also readied us for something beautiful. All month long, we've been in this series called Life Interrupted, where we've been exploring what it means to live in a world with COVID-19. We've been exploring how that has interrupted our lives. And we've tried to find ways to act like Jesus in the midst of a pandemic. Well, we're wrapping that series up today. And I wanted to leave you with this principle. God uses interruptions to make something beautiful out of something painful. Now we see this 
principle over and over throughout our lives. Think about babies. Nate and Kayla stopped by our house the other night. They live in our neighborhood. They were out just walking, and I was in the front yard working on my leaf blower, and so they just stopped and chatted, and I got to spend some time with them and their new baby daughter, Josephine. I didn't ask Kayla, but I'm fairly certain that that beautiful baby was the result of a really painful entrance into this world. Maybe you're someone who finds beauty in sport. I think about Steph Curry. The things he can do on the hardwood with a basketball are just are, are really beautiful. But I guarantee you that that came as the result of a lot of painful working out and training in his life. Last week I was introduced to the music of Billie Eilish. Her music speaks to many people in ways that are really beautiful, but the thing is, her music really comes out of her own deep, painful experiences. You know, wherever you find great beauty, there's a better than decent chance that you're going to discover that it was birthed out of some painful experience. And oftentimes that happens because God uses interruptions to make something beautiful out of something painful. The most beautiful event in human history is what God did through his son, Jesus. The Apostle John gives us the most detailed accounting of what happened the night when Jesus was arrested. Almost a fourth of John's biography of Jesus, almost 25% of John's gospel, is devoted to what Jesus told his disciples that night. I want us to look at just a small fraction of what Jesus said that night. John chapter 16 is where we're going to be. Look at verse 32 with me. Jesus said, a time is coming and in fact has come when you will be scattered, each to your own home. You will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. Now I want to be really clear here, Jesus isn't talking about coronavirus. He's not talking about our stay-at-home order. What he was referring to is what would happen to his disciples following his arrest. They would be scattered. They would desert him. And in fact, that's exactly what happened. Nevertheless, I can relate to what Jesus is saying here because each of us has been scattered to our own homes. And what was true for Jesus that night is true for you too. You are not alone. Your Father is with you. Wherever you're watching right now, whether you're by yourself or you're with your family, you're not alone. The Father is with you. Whether it's Sunday morning in Lansing or it's Sunday night in India, whether you're surrounded by Christians or whether you're the only Christians in your neighborhood, I want you to know you're not alone. Your Father is with you. Look at what Jesus told his disciples next in verse 33. Jesus said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. That's important. Jesus said, in me you will have peace. Jesus didn't say, you'll have peace because you're in church. Jesus didn't say, you'll have peace because there's a Bible on your end table at home. He didn't say, you'll have peace because you're a part of a Bible study. Now, those are all good things. I, I think that we should all be a part of those things. But Jesus said, you'll have peace in me. Not because of a job or a steady income. Not because you have someone to share your life with. Jesus said, you will have peace in me. And one of the things this pandemic has revealed, at least to my mind, is that too many Christians are looking to the government to find peace. Too many Christians are trusting in science and medicine to find peace. Too many Christians are asserting their constitutional rights because they don't have a sense of peace. Many are collapsing in despair and anxiety because they lack peace. Many are protesting because they don't have peace. What I want you to understand, church, is that ultimately our peace rests only in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I've told you these things so that in me you will have peace. And when you discover the kind of peace that Jesus is talking about here in John chapter 16, you'll discover that God can make something beautiful out of the most painful experiences in your life. 
Look at the second part of verse 33. Jesus said, I've told you these things so that in me you will have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. There are two statements there. And in order to understand them correctly, you really have to connect those two statements. If you separate those two statements, it can lead to some pretty warped thinking. Some people focus only on the first sentence. In this world, you will have trouble. But if that's where you stop, if you stop with that first sentence, it can lead to fatalism. You can begin to think that nothing good is ever going to happen to me, that God is against me. And if you follow fatalism to its natural conclusion, it leads to hedonism. Hey, let's just eat, let's drink, let's be merry because nothing matters. Tomorrow we're going to die. What's the point of it all? Some people ignore that first statement and they focus on the second statement. Take heart. I've overcome the world. You know, there's an entire so-called Christian industry built around statements like these that have been taken out of context. There are preachers who want to send you COVID cures. They want to send you miracle hankies. Just send me your money and you won't get sick. And the way they get around Scripture, the way they can sell that heresy is by ignoring the entire story and just pulling one part out of context. They just focus on, take heart, I've overcome the world. But listen, grammar matters. Conjunctions are important. Little words matter. That word but is an enormously large three-letter word because it connects those two statements together. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. You know how the Father overcame the world? Through the cross. The cross is the ultimate interruption because it is the pivot point on which all of eternity hinges. The cross is a reminder of these two overlapping realities that in this world you will have trouble, but God has overcome the world. The cross is a reminder that God can take something incredibly painful and out of it can fashion something incredibly beautiful. You know, I think had you been there on the day Jesus was crucified, you would have viewed the cross as a horrible, senseless, tragic evil. Had you been there, you would have thought at the time that the cross is the worst possible thing that could be happening right now. And yet as we look back on the cross, we realize that God was doing something beautiful in the cross. And that's why we create art that depicts the cross. We wear jewelry that reminds us of the cross. We write and sing songs about the old rugged cross. We recognize the cross as something God did that was incredibly beautiful while not forgetting that it was the result of something that was enormously painful. You know, if you let God, God will use your interruption to create something beautiful in you too. God wants to write a beautiful new chapter in your life through the pain and through the heartache that you sometimes experience. And so as we wrap up this series, here's what I want to ask you to do this week and in the coming weeks. Whenever you feel pain, I want you to go looking for beauty. Now, I know that seems counterintuitive. It might not make sense on the face of it, but just, just try it out. Just for the next week or the next few weeks, whenever you feel pain, go looking for beauty in the midst of that pain. Because I think what I can say is that the greater the pain you're experiencing, the greater the beauty you may discover. 
You see, I believe that God is going to use the pain of unemployment that many of you are experiencing right now to reveal to you the beauty of his provision. God's going to provide for you in ways that you never thought possible, that you never dreamed you would have experienced. And when you experience God providing for you, it's a beautiful thing. But the only way you can experience that, some of you, is by going through the pain of unemployment. God's going to use the loneliness that so many of you are feeling right now because of the forced social isolation that we're all experiencing. God is going to use the pain of that isolation and the loneliness that comes from it to reveal the beauty and the depth of the relationships that you have with friends and with family. God's going to use the pain of homeschooling that some of you are experiencing right now to reveal the beauty and the appreciation that you have for your children's teachers and the beauty that you see in your children when they learn something new and that light bulb goes on in their head and their face lights up as they achieve some new challenge. God's going to use the pain of a missed graduation or a senior sports season that was canceled to do something beautiful in your life. And here's the thing, a lot of times we don't yet know what that beautiful thing is. Sometimes it can take a while to discover what it is or what it was. But in faith, we declare God is going to make something beautiful from your pain. And whenever you doubt that, Or whenever you're uncertain of that, just look at what Jesus did for you and me on the cross. Let's pray together. God, we trust that you're going to make something beautiful out of the painful experiences that we've endured through this life interruption. We declare as your people in faith that we believe you will work all things for the good. Because we love you and we're called according to your purpose. Lord, we give you thanksgiving and praise for the good things you're going to do, for the beauty that you're going to craft and create out of these painful experiences. God, we ask you to strengthen our faith when we are weak, when we doubt that you can create something beautiful and something good out of our pain and our confusion. Lord, strengthen our faith in you. Help us to trust you in spite of our doubts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I've said a couple different times during this series that when we pause to take communion, it's a sacred interruption that enables us to reflect on who Jesus is and what he did for us on the cross. And as you do that right now in your home, wherever you're at or whomever you're with, As you pause and remember what Jesus did for you on the cross, as you contemplate the pain he endured, will you thank God for the beautiful redemption that resulted from what Jesus did for us on the cross?
are here, you are holy, we are standing in your glory, you are here, you are holy, we are standing in your glory, you are here, you are holy, we are standing
Church, it's time for our offering. You know, when we face challenges like the one we're in right now, we can see either obstacles or opportunities. The thing is, this challenge presents both. The obstacles are pretty obvious, but the opportunities are easy to overlook. Many of you have seized this opportunity to express your trust in God by faithfully contributing to our ministry in giving your tithe. It hasn't gone unnoticed by me, but I want you to know that God notices too. The Apostle Paul wrote these words to Christians living in ancient Greece. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I believe when we all cheer at offering time, whether it's at 6300 Aurelius Road or when we're scattered in living rooms throughout the community, that God smiles. So thank you for giving. And not only giving, but giving cheerfully. There are three ways you can give. You can give through our app, through our website, or by texting G-I-V-E to 517-305-2055. Let's pray. God, thank you for being generous to us and for supplying all we need. Help us to continue to be generous to you and generous to others, knowing that our giving makes a difference. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Our time together is about over, and we want to inform you about what's coming up at South. Next week is Grad Sunday. Grad Sunday is our annual celebration of our graduates from high school and beyond. We'll not only celebrate their accomplishments thus far, but also their plans for the future. Please make sure to tune in. And now here's Pastor Frank to talk about our return to in-person worship. Church reopenings have been in the news since President Trump declared churches essential and urged governors to facilitate their reopening. Like all of you, I'm looking forward to gathering again on Aurelius Road, but let me be clear about something. Reopening isn't quite the right word because we never really closed. No, we haven't been able to meet together, but our ministry has continued without interruption. Children and middle school students have benefited from videos and curriculum distributed by our very capable Josh Antonopoulos. High school students have enjoyed Modified Live on Monday nights. Our missionaries have continued to receive our financial and prayer support, and our staff pivoted to online worship, enabling us to grow spiritually while keeping us safe physically. That last phrase is key to understanding our church's response to COVID-19. Our goal has been to protect you physically while still encouraging you spiritually. That's our priority as we determine the best time to return to in-person gatherings. So when will that happen? We're depending on guidance from the Centers for Disease Control and the state and federal governments to help us decide. We hope to have our detailed plan finalized, but we're not quite there yet. Our church staff has had three funerals in three weeks, and that's put us a bit behind. Still, we want to release the overview of our reopening plan to give you an idea of the benchmarks we want to meet before we meet together again. Now, that overview is on our website, and you can read it there. Our plan depends on Michigan's Safe Start plan. Right now, our area is in phase three, and that means we're still under a stay-at-home order. A move to phase four will trigger our phased-in plan to return to corporate worship gatherings. When will that happen? We don't know, because we don't know when the state will move us to the next phase. But if I were to speculate, and the key word there is speculate, I think that will be sometime in mid-July. Could be sooner, it could be later, depending on how our community does controlling the spread of coronavirus. Our plan isn't perfect. It won't meet everyone's expectations. Some may think it too restrictive. Others may think it too careless. So here's what I want to ask you to do. Look beyond the details and see the heart behind it. 
We want to protect you physically and encourage you spiritually. When we're able to gather again, we want everyone to be there, including our more at-risk members who stayed healthy because the rest of us looked not only to our own interests, but to the interests of others, as the Apostle Paul put it. In the meantime, I know some of you are eager to help us reopen our building. Now, before we can do that, we have some major sanitizing to do. In fact, our custodians are putting together a team of people to clean and repair our chairs, over 500 of them. If you'd like to volunteer to be on that crew, click on the link in the chat section to sign up. We also need people to help with our annual spring landscaping cleanup. Normally, we have that completed by Mother's Day, but this year we're understandably behind. So if that's something you can help us with, click on the link and sign up. Finally, all of us can pray, and we ask you to do just that. Pray for each other. Pray for frontline workers. Pray for our leaders in the government and in our church. And pray that our nation will use this difficult intermission to turn to God and experience peace and hope. Earlier this week, I saw some of our church at a funeral, and I was reminded how much I love you and miss you. I can't wait to gather again, hopefully soon. So if you have any questions, shoot me an email or call. And until then, keep your hands clean and your heart pure. Father, I thank you that we can continue to be your church, even in the midst of this challenging time. Lord, give us patience as we wait for the day when it's safe for us to gather again in one place to worship. And until that day, may we continue to be your church in the places where you've planted us, where we live, and where we work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great week, church.